I suppose that what's required, I talk about this politically and spiritually frequently, is a form of confederacy. You're talking about a a kind of confederation of organised local food. It's not about distribution, really. It's about growth growth and local distribution as opposed to global distribution. Exactly. You can see that that means that diets might become more seasonal and that um, the kind of food we eat more governed by nature but it's our attempt to overwhelm nature uh, again not because of like the con- the desire of the consumer but as you explained the origins of these ideas are in global trade ideology it's not exactly. like oh we need strawberries 24 7 we need to be connected to nature we need to be harmonized with the natural forces that um that, that have guided our lives through evolution through environmental change and natural selection now uh, one of the things that we are discovering in the corona virus is that supply chains are going to start to break down. This system cannot sustain itself. I was struck by the call of manufacturers and airlines for bailout support in much the same way as the banks were bailed out through quantitative easing in 2008, whereby sometimes through crisis of various kinds, whether financial or in this case sort of a microbiological, it, the reality is suddenly exposed that we're living beneath the veneer of an artificial system that exists it's not for the benefit of the people that it's supposed to serve, but for the benefit of the people at the top of the various hierarchical pyramids. Yeah, and it's so remarkable that we're letting this happen because when we step back and look at the bigger picture, you know, the actual winners in this type of growth is less than 1% of the global population. Mm. So we really are crazy to, to let this happen. But I think what I see as the biggest problem is that at the grassroots, there is this amazing, natural, spontaneous localization movement growing, but it needs to be reinforced by more knowledge of the vulnerability and the destruction of the global system. I believe that if more people could hear this message, that we would find in a very, very rapid, uh, you know, in a very short time, that people say, yeah, we don't want a system that makes less than 1% richer and richer, and that at every step of the way right now is pushing government, business, us as individuals to use more energy and technology for every single thing that's done, whether in education, healthcare, in every arena, the push is towards more energy, more technology, and we're dumping the human race, this overabundant renewable resource of people, we're just dumping, and when we dump them, Part of what happens is fundamentalism, terrorism, violence, abuse. Addiction, mental addiction, illness. Addiction, mental illness, absolutely. And this is because human life itself is no longer regarded as sacred because we have been deposited in new roles as consumers above all else and this is exacerbated over the last hundred years and often times of crisis can be an opportunity for review I was saying before in a YouTube video I did on my YouTube channel that, that I've, ne- I've never experienced anything that's so simultaneously global and personal, it's wherever you go in the world or wherever who you communicate with in the world they're affected by it and then you are individually affected because you're thinking what's going to happen to my financial situation, then you go to the supermarket as I just did and like oh my god so like in a way Helena, do you see this as a kind of a global opportunity for us to instantiate different systems? And what do those systems look like? Does it mean that we're growing our own food individually? Does it mean that we're living in more tribalized communities? How do you see it working in a like in a place like Devon, England, or a place like Mullumbimby in Australia, or Ojai, California, or wherever you are in the world? How how do people change? How do we free ourselves from these d- deeply embedded tendrils of a global capitalist system? Well, it's first of all, it's really important to look at it both from a psychological point of view and from the structural point of view. And also, I hope people do go to our website because we have examples of how it is happening already. So right here in Malambimbi, in Devon, and in Ojai, there's already a demonstration of what we need to do. And what that is, is first of all, start building the interdependent human scale local economy. And let's remember, which our leaders do not, and I mean our political and economic leaders, that there's nothing more important that we produce as human beings than food. Right. You know, water we don't produce. 
and we think we do sometimes, but you know, food is also the activity that most of the human race evolved with in production, in harvesting, in processing. It's in our DNA, and it's also a reason why people respond so amazingly well to the farmer's market, to the amazing smaller, more diversified farms that are demonstrating that you can, in just a few years, produce vastly more by diversifying, by coming back to having both some vegetables, some fruits, some animals, very important part of it, that they actually, in that diversified system, you will always be able to produce more than you ever can in monoculture. But what it needs is more people on the land, and it needs... Uh, support because we're subsidizing the monocultures, we're subsidizing the situation so that food that's been transported from 10,000 miles away will cost less than food from a mile away. That's in a completely manipulated economy and that supports the technology, the fossil fuels, you know, the chemicals are also technology that replace people. And then we get this artificial situation where the toxic, you know, processed food costs much less than healthy local organic food. But so in terms of what it looks like, there are just, well, first of all, I hope if you haven't seen it, Russell, I hope you look at the biggest little farm, which is actually making a bit of a name for itself. It's a fabulous film that shows this farm outside LA, about two hours outside LA, that took this barren monoculture, dead, 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 and unproductive and in just a few years turned it into this inspiring, thriving farm that also gave space to wildlife, that, you know, the, the remarkable thing is that we can, and people are at the grassroots, showing that we can produce vastly more using less land and less water. And they're doing it also by using more adapted indigenous, non-hybrid, you know, non-corporate seeds, varieties of animals. They're going back to the heirloom varieties that are adapted to different ecosystems, you know, adapted to the cold or the heat or the water. So this, the local food economy is, is the most important. It's also the biggest, clearest sign of what we need to do. And it's not everyone growing food in their back garden. It's about restoring a balance between city and country and allowing more smaller towns and even villages to survive. And one of the movements I'm connected to is one in China where this agricultural professor whom I first met in 2006 started a rural reconstruction movement precisely to try to counter the dominant trend into the city that dominant trend into the city is what's being pushed structurally by the global market and big business. So, a lot more to say. Shall I say a bit more? No, let me ask this question if you don't mind, Helena. The, this idea about sort of empowering small communities, towns and villages, I was, I was struck by how that idea is kind of controlled by conservatism and the right, typically. You know, when you think of like the, you know, like for example, Brexit, or the rise of Trump, broadly regarded as sort of a kind of right-wing reflux, a reaction against you know, sort of detached neoliberalism, so shall we say. And actually, there's a point where all these ideologies start to meet, where you recognise that people that are, like, are, say, conservative, though in a way there's nothing actually conservative about a human being, that's like saying you were born a Tottenham fan or something, like... You, that really the values there are like are understandable like nationalism is tribalism reappropriated conservatism is wanting to protect people wanting to protect your community all of these things in a sense get artificially grown as if they get fertilized gmo'd modified emotions modified psychological states to all of our natural anthro anthropological resources are harnessed and harvested again in the service of a globalized idea that does not serve the people that have become enslaved by it and give their lives for it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, this is also what I saw so clearly in Ladakh and Bhutan is that when people have strong intergenerational local community, first of all, I hope we can talk more about that because it creates a completely different identity. It creates a secure identity where people, children grow up feeling fine about just 
how they are and who they are. They're not being compared to some idea of progress. They've got to be better. And before they're even born, we've got to worry about getting them into a good school and they have to get into that city and get that job. So we've created this intensely competitive monoculture, basically a consumer monoculture. And nationalism was a way of breaking down the community fabric. And when people had that local identity to one another and to their place, to the land, to the water, to the trees, and they knew that that's what sustained them, they also generally were far more responsible in terms of the use of resources. But the nation state was a big step created by top-down forces with big megaphones standing there and saying, no, no, you are German, you are English, you are Indian. And I saw how even in places like Ladakh and Bhutan, even the football that was brought in, that was so different from the football people used to play. They used to have local games, but it was never this war of and it was like it was this the, the way the football has been perverted is like it's totally part of the nationalism that is against the other and it's not just a fun game you know so this is where i think a lot of people you know who haven't had that experience of seeing a healthy local economy and a healthy local community have gone wrong in so many people on the left are sort of harking back to the you know actually using often Scandinavia as the model of what we should be, you know, and I grew up in Sweden and saw that after the war, especially in Sweden, you know, people had been herded off the land, you know, was brought in was the chemicals that were used in the war to put them on the land and lots of um, technology using cheap fossil fuels, which weren't cheap at all, Mm. pushing people off the land into high rise concrete buildings full of fossil fuels and People sitting there already in the 70s in every dwelling, uh, in half of all the dwellings, one person living alone, loneliness, alcoholism, depression, suicide. So we had even in that relatively benign form of industrialism and globalism, because it was global businesses that were benefiting and driving things in that more benevolent form, we still had huge ecological, spiritual, social problems. So, um, yeah, I mean, what I feel too is a complete understanding for many of my colleagues who've been very resistant to localization. Many of my, you know, dear friends and colleagues, you know, like Naomi Klein and all kinds of people, they have been fearful of localism because they've thought of it as right wing. And I believe this is partly connected to the fact that if you go around, especially the industrialized world, into smaller local communities where there might still be quite a lot of community, you're talking about communities that have been marginalized for hundreds of years, and you're talking about people that out of the competition and fear have often become more prejudiced, more xenophobic, and more conservative in a not very healthy way. So what I'm trying to raise awareness about is the understanding that every psychologist will tell you that when you have strong, deep self-respect, that's when you're able to be far more tolerant of diversity, and it's the insecurity that breeds prejudice and fear. 